It's the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> when I get home at night and uh, start playing with the kids, I tend to get down on the floor and roughhouse with them a bit. And Sophia will run up to me and she'll say, lift me up. And I will look at her and say, how, now how, how should you say that? And she'll say, lift me up, please. One of these days she's going to remember to say it the first time. Uh, it'll be great. But then I'll lift her up and squeeze her ribs and, and she'll squeal. And, and I can then put her down. And I can do this a few times. And then eventually she gets a bit heavy and, and got to find a new way to play. And for a while there, the, the next way she wanted to play was uh, she wanted to stick her fingers in my belly button. And I did not like this. I did not like this one bit, and if you do not uh, know this odd sensation of having little fingers, fingers scrabbling into your belly button, I can loan you a kid for you to experience it, or you can take my word for it. Now, Sophia herself does not like anyone to touch her belly button, does not like any clothing to touch it, uh, pants, anything tights. I foresee this being a challenge in her future, but uh, she's just been fascinated with belly buttons. Belly buttons are an intense source of amusement for kids, an easy thing to play with when you're young. But eventually we grow up, and what is a belly button then? When you're old enough to dress yourself, what is a belly button? A belly button is a reminder that you have always been connected. Right? Since the very beginning, you are connected to other people. You can spend your days working on your career, driving your car, spending your money. You can be self-sufficient, independent, a self-made modern person. And then when a young child shoves her fingers into your belly button, you have no choice but to remember, ah, yeah, belly button. Connected, right, from the very beginning. This connection, this sense of living by the gift of others, this fact that we have always, from the very beginning, been connected, we call this community, right? We have always been part of a community. And so as we move from Sabbath last week, looking at how Sabbath is the day that's for community, for the coming together of family and fried chicken, it is fitting that this Sunday we look at the next of the commandments and it is looking at the first community, parents, right? Who are your first neighbors? Your parents. Right? They're your first neighbors. Your parents. They're the ones you live with who show you what community means, what it looks like, what it tastes like, what it feels like. The love of neighbors, which the rest of the Ten Commandments focuses on, begin, focuses on the love of neighbors. Who, your first, it's fitting we begin with the first neighbors, right? Parents. Your parents are your first neighbors. And so how do we honor our parents as the commandment lays out? The word itself helps us understand it. The Hebrew word here for honor has this sense of, sense of weightiness, of heft, of presence, right? To honor your parents is to respect the weight that they carry in your lives. That, to always remember that they have this amazingly important role to respect it. Never forget it. Don't downplay it. Don't pretend that they are anything less than what they are, the people who gave you life. Now this sermon's going to go online, and I fully expect my mother to take this clip, make it into a ringtone, and play it back to me every time I disagree with her. But uh, th th that's what it is, right? We, we honor our parents when we remember the weight that they have in our lives. In the, it, when it talks in the Bible about disrespecting our parents, the, the term disrespect to, is a, has a sense of lightness. Like, if you're taking something too lightly, right? To disrespect your parents is to not take them with enough weight, with enough honor, right? To, to treat them, to sort of brush them off, to take them less than seriously. That's what it means to disrespect parents. And if you think about who's reading the commandment, it's those who could disrespect their parents. Think about who's reading the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments say things like, don't murder, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Who's of an age that they could murder or covet a neighbor's wife? Right? An adult. You don't, the Ten Commandments were not aimed at little, little Timmy, a five-year-old. They were aimed at parent, they were aimed at people who were old enough to murder or to covet. They were aimed at old, people old enough that they could brush off their parents, right? And so this is the reminder, even when you think you're all, you know it all and you're all grown up, still, 
honor your parents. Give weight to the role of your parents in your life, especially when you can choose not to do so. This commandment, it's the one with the promise, right? Honor your parents, and you shall live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. This is a generational promise. When, if you are a generation that honors your parents, the next generation, they will honor you. You build a family life that honors parents, and when you, you honor your parents and take care of them, and then when you need to be taken care of, you will, live in a, you will be in a family that, that will take care of parents. Now, of all the commandments, all of the commandments, think of all ten of them, this is the one that I felt like maybe we could pull off a short sermon on. Right, just sing an extra hymn for Mama, call it a day right here. I could point out that uh, moms and dads are equal in this. Honor your mother and your father. This is a, a move for gender equality. Isn't that great? So go call your children have, or go have coffee with your mom, uh, mom and dad or just go, go celebrate family today. Yippee family, amen. I, I wish that that could be the end of the sermon. Just honor your parents. Great, done, end of sermon. But I couldn't end the sermon here because I kept on thinking. And the more I thought about it, the more complicated honoring your parents get. Ever, the more, ever have that happen? The more you think about it, the more complicated it gets. Right? The more I th thought about parents, I kept on running cr across complications and questions and problems. Those three, complications, questions, and problems. Complications. Honoring your parents is a lot harder now than it used to be. I was talking to someone about this. You start asking people about your parents, and everyone has stories, right? So I was talking to someone this week about her parents and uh, family farm type of situation, right? And so they, they were running, the, their parents ran the farm, and then they started helping run the farm, and the parents got older, and, and the farm account, that's where all the money went. All the money the far, farm made went into the farm account, and the farm account paid for the parents to live. It paid for them to live. And when, it, it was simple, right? When children came of age, you put their, their name on the farm account, and when the parents died, their names came off on the farm account. Family business, family farm, really simple. You know where you stand at all times. How many families have that happen nowadays? Right? Most children don't stay in the family farm. They go off and they do something else. And how many families talk about money? They don't, right? Money is the great taboo. We don't talk intergenerationally about money. I have not met a single family where the parents and the children are talking forthrightly about where they each stand monetarily. At least not until something goes really bad, right? Either the parents get to the point where everything's gone, fallen apart and they have to help right now, or the children, it can happen to the children too. And so it used to be everyone was on the same accounts, everyone was on part of the farm, you always knew where everyone stood, and now, we all, all want to be independent and self-sufficient and all that until we can't be. And so the way that we uh, handle money makes it harder to care for parents because it's harder to keep track of how parents are doing and honoring them and, and taking, respecting them in their old age. Another complication <coughs> is when it comes to housing. If you think of those old farmhouses, if mama had to move back in, you had room, didn't you? Did, who here has room in their house for mama anymore? Right? We build houses that are one family houses, and the doors aren't big enough for, for wheelchairs, are they? And, and then you throw in health pro mental health problems. It's not the, the physical health problems that I, I find the most intimidating thinking about this, but something like two-thirds of people as they age are going to hit some sort of mental health problem, and you, you can't care for your parents if they're hitting mental health problems. You just can't. You can't leave and have to worry about whether well, your mom is going to leave the stove on and burn down the place. And so it is complicated to talk about honoring and respecting and caring for your parents today. And then you start hitting some of the questions that are challenging. Can a, can a parent ask a child to make a promise that extends past their death? When you start talking about inheritance, do, do you need to spend the inheritance in the same way your parents would have? Then you start hitting the problems, right? I, re, I, started to, I, I had not thought about how complicated parent, parental relationships could be, uh, not really, until I found a story this week um, about an NFL player he got drafted, right? Or he got drafted in the NFL, $12 million deal, four years, with a $4 million signing bonus. And his mama looks at him right after this is announced. The family's all right there. This is the part of the party. Yeah, yippee, he got drafted. The mama looks at her son and says, okay, I want a million of it for raising you. Whew. Ain't that an interesting family dynamic? Honor your mama and your dad, and does that mean paying him for having raised you? 
to tell you the punchline, he didn't. He bought her a house, because that's what NFL players do. They buy their mamas a house. But he did not give her a million dollars. Right? You start looking at the problems you can have with parents. You hear stories of a divorce. How do you honor your parents when they're divorced and they're trying to play you against the other one? Trying to make you take sides. How do you honor your parents I was hearing a story, a friend of mine uh, was telling me about his grandma and how his grandma had to go to a nursing home and she was angry and she would call and berate the, my friend's father. And I didn't put together, it together until later that uh, this would have been happening while my friend in, co in college, he had to take a year off to go get treated for cancer that almost killed him. And so my, this father's mom is chewing his butt because she doesn't want to be in the nursing home and she can't understand why they wouldn't take every cent the family owns to get her in the place where she wants to while he's trying to figure out to pay for his son's cancer treatments, right? How do you honor your mama when your mama's being greedy? How do you honor your, mom, your parents when they've disowned you? How do you honor your parents when, uh, you know, if, yeah, it just gets, how do you honor your parents when if you do anything other than they tell you, they think that you're turning against them, right? These are hard. Now, I'm not going to try to make sense of all of these. I'm just throwing these out there so we can all, I mean, this is, this is complicated. I'm going to try to get at a sense of how do we honor our parents in less than ideal situations. I'm going to throw out the, the caveat I usually throw out, throw out at this point. Um, I reserve the right to be wrong. I might be about to exercise that right. And, and so uh, speaking as a 35-year-old male of young children whose parents are in their 50s, if I say something stupid in the next couple minutes, please tell me. Here I go. Family is great as long as it's great, but when it's not, it gets real bad. And I think we need to be clear about the difference between honoring and obeying. There's a difference. The commandment is honor your parents. We always honor our parents. We don't get a choice in that. We honor our parents. Obeying is a different matter. It says in Ephesians 6, obey your parents. And if you just take that verse, you can get in a lot of trouble because you've got to read the whole passage. The whole passage says, submit to each other as Christ submitted to us. Husbands submit to wife, wife submit to husband, children submit to parents. And as long as everyone's doing that, that's great, right? As long as people are serving each other in the way that Christ served us, you should obey your parents. No matter how old you are, that will get cut up and played back to me by my mama. However, if your parents are not saying to do something that is right, you don't do it. Right? You can honor your parents without obeying them. Sometimes your parents say something that is not worth being obeyed. Right. And that, that's where we hit the, the, hit the hitch. This is great as long as parents are living up, upright, worthy lives, lives following Jesus Christ. But the point at which they are not is the point at which you say, I honor you. I'm never going to downplay the role you play in my life, but I can't do that. We always honor our parents and we obey them as long as they are worthy of being obeyed. There are times in Scripture where we see this. In Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, the prophet talks about how God calls, this is Ezekiel, Ezekiel 20, I said to their children in the wilderness, do not follow the statutes of your parents. Do not observe their ordinances. Do not defile yourself with their idols. I'm the Lord your God. Follow my statutes. Right? The parents were not walking as they ought to, and God says to the children, don't do like your parents. If you read the, the books of the kings, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, there are story after story of kings who break from the ways of their parents and are praised for it. King Asa, First Kings 13, is an example of this. There are kings who are praised for breaking from the idolatrous ways of their parents. And so we always honor our parents because they're the ones who gave life. They are, they are our first neighbors who, whom we are called to love. And we obey them as long as they are worthy of being obeyed. This sense of obe obedience extends not only to what they say, but to their example as well. We follow the example of our parents, right? Because we all turn into our parents. How old were you when you opened your mouth and for the first time your mom or your dad came out? When did, when did that hit, right? 
It happens to me on a regular basis. Oh, that was, that was dad. Actually, for me, it's my mom more often because we, we critique meals. I'll start critiquing a meal and it's, it's, it's my mom, right? It happens. We are going to turn into our parents to a certain degree, but there are ways in which we say, my parents did that and I'm not. I honor them, but I'm not going to do that. First, so for those for whom family life is not great, I also want to hold out this hope that here is the church. And the church is indeed the church family. In this place, we find, we have, you can find fathers and mothers and children and aunts and uncles. You can find the family to hold you when your family is less than it ought to be. Here we gather and we learn how to practice being family, to work through being family together, always hoping that that which is broken in our, our own, own families might change. God is always calling, the Holy Spirit is always moving, Jesus is still asking people to follow. And when people say yes to Jesus, some crazy things happen. Things change. Things you might never expect, right? And we keep on praying and loving our own children as well because, you know, they might change as well. Now, I do need to say one thing, and this is where it gets interesting, because I'm 35, and many of you are, have a little, little bit of age on me. And so I'm going to suggest something, and I'm going to suggest it humbly and cautiously. I'm going to suggest that parents of adult children, you're used to setting the discussion, aren't you? You've been set, sort of setting the table for a long time, which means you set what can be talked about. It might be that part of honoring parents and being part of being honorable and worthy of honor, and in all of this, being a good family, is being sure to ask a question or two on occasion. It might not be a bad idea to say, are there any conversations that you've been avoiding that we need to have as a parent? Because you all remember what it's like. If your parents don't want to talk about something, you ain't going to talk about it. But maybe you should have. And maybe we all need to make sure to say to our children, is there something we need to talk about that we have not been talking about? Is there anything we need to talk about for the good of the family? And then be sure to listen because, you know, here's the real truth of family. Parents will always have 20 to 30 years more practice being stubborn. You will always be more stubborn than your children. You have more practice at it. And your children are always going to be strange because they're always going to be the next generation. And they're always going to be playing with toys and gadgets and gizmos that you will not understand. And so you're going to have to listen, because you're more stubborn and they're weirder. It might take a while to get through. <laughs> I want to end this story with the story of grace, because you start talking about family, and you, you make decisions about family, and you can beat yourself up about the decisions you make. And I want to end with the story of grace that comes out of this book, the book of Ruth. Now, we all know the story of Ruth. Ruth is the, the woman who goes back with her mother-in-law. But at the beginning of the story, there, there's this important moment, right? Naomi, this woman, she is married. She has two sons. She goes to a foreign land. The two sons get married. And then all the men die. I don't know why, but the, Naomi's husband, dead. Her two sons, dead. And so there she is with her two daughter-in-laws. They've got to figure out what's next. And so Naomi is saying, I can go back to Israel and put something together. I don't think you should go with me, though, because I don't have any more kids. You need to go back to your families. And what happens? Ruth goes with her, and Ruth is beloved and wonderful and great. What about the other daughter-in-law? Her name is Orpah. Don't hear much about Orpah, do you? Orpah goes back to her family. And she doesn't go back to her family with Naomi chewing her butt because she is ditching her. Naomi hugs her. They kiss. They weep. They're sad they're going to leave each other. Ruth goes with her, Orpah does not. They make two very different decisions, and they're both beloved daughter-in-laws, right? You make the decision you make that makes sense for your family, as they, the two of them did, and that, that's the best you can do in the moment. That's the best you can do in the moment. We will make decisions about how to honor our parents, how to be honorable as parents, and whatever works out from family to family is going to vary. It's going to vary from situation to situation, and that's okay. As people with belly buttons, we're connected, but that doesn't mean we always have to do the exact same thing. So the commandment, honor your parents, and by the grace of God, be honorable as parents, and you shall live long in the land that God is giving you. Thanks be to God. Amen.